Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer, and I'm interrupting the usual Superhouse programming for this special episode. Today I need to talk to you about a topic that might be a little bit confronting, but I think it's a really important thing for anyone who builds a home automation system to think about. Two years ago today, Chris Yeo, a really well-known free software developer, passed away after a battle with cancer. Now, being a true geek, Chris was into home automation as well. He liked gadgets. But when he passed away, information about how those systems worked was lost. Now, Chris's situation, as tragic as it was, was actually pretty close to a best-case scenario for this sort of thing. Because the cancer took quite some time, he knew well in advance that he would have to make plans for, uh, for his family so that people who lived in the house after him would be able to make use of the things that he put in place. And in addition to that, his wife is a super smart software engineer. So if anyone was going to be able to make sense of the systems in the house, she was. Unfortunately, when he passed away, his wife and young daughter were left with the situation where there were items in the house that they couldn't control. Chris had done a bit of work with documenting what needed to be done. He'd archived software, put things aside, but even with all of this best case planning, there are still things that are problems for them. Now, if you think about the, the situation of a family member passing away, it doesn't matter how much documentation you put in place or how carefully you plan for that. There is not just the technical issue of what is the password to log into this particular system. You also have to think about the emotional circumstances. For his wife, it's now a very difficult situation because in order to access that, to access some of the files that uh, he set aside. She now has to open things. So you have to also think about the emotional aspect, not just the practical, oh, have I written down the password aspect. Now in my software company, we have a business continuity concept that we just call the bus number. And that is how many people would have to be hit by a bus for a certain critical piece of knowledge or information to be lost. If there is a particular thing that only one person knows, like why was the software designed this way? Or what is the password to that third party API that we need for our software to work? And that person gets hit by a bus and nobody else knows it. You got a bus number of one and that is a really bad thing to have. So we always try to make sure that we have a bus number of two or higher for anything that is critical to business continuity. So as someone that's built my own home automation system, I have to think about this bus number factor. I could finish this video now, walk down the street, be hit by a bus. And then the question is, how is my family going to continue living in this house? If the controller that runs the light switches crashes, who knows how it works? If it has a problem, who knows where the source code is? I wrote that source code, it's sitting on my computer. And maybe there is some problem, it needs to be fixed two years down the track, five years down the track. Who's going to know how to do that? And that is the sort of thing that I've been putting a lot of thought into. So in this video, I'm going to show you two methods that you can use to try to reduce that danger for yourself and for your family. Now, the good news is that by doing this, you're not just helping your family out in a possible future, really bad scenario. You're also going to help yourself out in the short term because doing these two things will help you even if nothing goes wrong. So my first tip is about solving the bootstrapping problem. And yes, it's documentation related, but maybe you haven't used it quite this way before. The way I think about it is, imagine I'm not here anymore for whatever reason. Aliens come along and beam me up. And my wife wants to get some stuff fixed around the house. How do they get started? A random electrician turns up, they look at the place, they go, Mamma mia, I don't understand. So how do they start? The very first place they're going to look is the switchboard. This is the um, automation switchboard here. So what I've done is put a clipboard just inside the switchboard and it's got some bootstrap information in it. Let's take a look at what I've got in there. So the first point is that it starts with some contact information. Now this is a redacted version because I don't want to show personal information on here, but it has the name of my electrician and his mobile phone number. So failing all else, my wife could come and grab this out of the cupboard and just call the number on there. Or if another electrician turns up, what they can do is look at this and say, well, maybe he'll have some clue what's going on, and that's a starting point. 
they can call the electrician and get some information. The second point is how I manage this document. So this is a hard copy obviously and what I've done is save this as a Google Doc and then I periodically update it. I keep these hard copies in the switchboards and whenever I make changes to anything I just hand write in it and then periodically I grab this go back to my computer apply all of the handwritten changes and print a new copy then I just put it on the clipboard stick it back in there and then life goes on we've got the new version so the document starts with some information about my internet connection who the provider is what phone number to call for tech support username and password MAC address and various other things. I also document problems that I have and then later I can look back through here and say oh yeah there was that particular problem on that date, connection dropped out or whatever. Then I've got a map of the house. So here I show the general locations of different things within the building itself. So that if an electrician turns up with no prior knowledge, he can look at this and say oh yeah that particular telco space B, cupboard west is there and they can actually find this within the house. And then because I obsessively label all of the cables, both data and power, I have a data labeling scheme identified here. And then a list of all of the data circuits. So this is terminal space B, which is located in the garage, and it's patch panel A. So I have all of the devices, where they're terminated, what they're used for, pages and pages of it and all the ports on all the switches and the switches themselves, patch panels, are all labelled to match this. So that's patch panel B, and you can see some handwritten notes in there. Patch panel C, so this is all in the same telco space. And you can see notes here, for example, it's got a FOSCAM camera on it, it's got 5 volt, 2 amp power over ethernet, so it's got some information there that might be useful. And here I said was camera and nothing connected. There was PoE 12 volt on here, but it's been taken away. So these are the sorts of changes that I need to make now to the master document and then reprint this. And then there is documentation of how the power is labeled as well. So that you can look at a label and see what that cable is, where it's coming from, where it's going to. And this is a layout of all of the relays that are mounted on the DIN rails in the switchboard. With this, the electrician can just look at it and see, oh yeah, that particular relay controls the main bathroom lights. Everything is labelled. Terminal space C, likewise, all of the panels being labelled. And then I've just got some extra pages in the back, which has got some other documentation, notes about things. So you might have great documentation on your computer, but what use is that if someone walks in and they don't have access to your computer? They don't know where to begin looking. You really need something like this as a bootstrap that then directs people to the information they need for everything else. So I always keep these right here with the switchboards. Now for the next tip we need to take a little trip up here. So imagine that it's some years down the track. You may not even be living here anymore or Maybe it's you and you want to make some changes to your system. You come along to something that you've got installed inside uh, your ceiling. It doesn't really matter. It could be anywhere. It could be even somewhere that's really easily accessible. And you've got this device, but you don't know what software is running on it. Well, what I've got right here is a little USB memory stick. What I've found is that often when I set up a device like this, I'll compile the firmware to run on it. But then I might have a few different versions. I might have compiled one version for, say, an Arduino Mega, another one for an Arduino Due. They've got the same header, but they might have different pin allocations, or maybe they use different versions of libraries. And often I'll end up with multiple versions of a project, and if I come back two or three years later and I want to make a change to this, I need to know exactly what software is running on that device. With this USB memory stick here, I can just pull that off stick it in my computer, and I'll have copies of the libraries and the exact source code that was compiled to run on this. And for reasons that are a bit of an inside joke, I always name these little memory sticks Death Star, because it's where the plans are kept. And all I have to do is open it up, and you can see the libraries that are required in here, FT OLED, Pub Sub Client, because this uses MQTT and can support an OLED display. And there is the sketch itself. 
I've even put a readme in there and I have the source code that was compiled to make this work. So you might think that this is stupid, why not just keep track of what you used? I mean if you've got a device just remember what source code you used last time when you compiled it. Well that's fine if you only have a couple of projects but I have hundreds and hundreds of Arduino projects nested two, three, four levels deep and uh, I have many that have the same sort of name as well so it's really hard to keep track of. And also that's fine if it's you but imagine that someone else is trying to figure out what this device is doing when you're long gone. If they can just chuck this memory stick into their computer and see, oh, there's README, there's source code, that's what's running on it, it will make their life a hell of a lot easier. Now, it doesn't even have to be a USB memory stick. You could use an SD card or something like that. Basically, any common you know, little removable flash storage device will do just fine. You've probably got a whole bunch of these lying around. Even if you have to buy them, they're only a few dollars each, and it can save you a whole lot of grief. Now, I got the idea for doing this from a friend of mine who works on commercial products. And what he does is go actually a whole lot further than this. Because you can have a situation where, say, a compiler will change over time, if you're creating a product and you want to be able to recreate the firmware that's on that product down the track, you don't just need the source code. You also need the entire tool chain, even right down to the operating system. So what he does is create an archive of the complete software environment. His entire uh, machine essentially converts it to a virtual machine and then just sticks it on a storage medium like this. Then he can come back five years later, use the same source code, uh, run up that virtual machine. And he knows that if he compiles it, he's going to get the exact same bytes coming out as he did when he originally created the product. Now, I don't care about going to that extreme. I just want the libraries and the source code. If the compiler has updated and I get a slightly different binary out of it, well, I can figure that out. So I'd like to leave you with three takeaways from this particular video. It's a shorter one than usual, but hopefully there's been something useful in here. Firstly, create some kind of bootstrapping documentation. Keep a document that you can refer back to and see why you connected something to something else. Now, it occurred to me after I showed you that document earlier that other people might want to use something as a template to get started. So I've copied my document and I've set it up as a template. And if you go along to the Superhouse site, in fact, there'll be a URL, superhouse.tv slash cabling dash guide. You'll be able to access that as a docx or as a Google doc. You can then modify it, use it for your own purposes. Secondly, make sure you keep copies of the source code for the projects you work on. Ideally, stick it right with the project itself. If you are building something and putting it in a box, put the source code in a memory stick, put it physically inside the case of the project. A couple of years down the track, you can come along, pull that project out, take the cover off, the source code is right there. Easy. Saves a whole lot of guesswork. And thirdly, if you have the means, consider donating to some form of cancer research or support group or something related to that field in memory of Chris. Now it seems to me that this episode could trigger a bit of discussion. I'd be really interested to know what things you might have done to try to make things easier for yourself in future or to future-proof your home automation system. What things do, can you think of that would make it easier in the future when you're not around and someone has to look after the systems that you've put in place? So thank you for watching and remember if you are just watching this on YouTube, you're missing out on most things. Go along and have a look at the episode page on superhouse.tv. In the meantime, go and build something cool. See ya.